The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Let's just take a small amount and try to put back the plants and grasses and flowers that used to be here before urbanization. Everybody has bad days. If you have someone that breaks you out of the rut, that can be all the difference in the world. The European anglers want to catch a big fish. Oh, it's lovely. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Oh uh, yeah, let's go out to the prairie. It's like a nice cool day today to do some work. These students are heading outside to learn a few things about the world around them. Spray your ankles. Today their classroom is about the size of a tennis court with grass, bugs, and as much biodiversity as they can shake a rake at. This is Wolf Prairie at Westside High School. It was going to be a third student parking lot, and fortunately for everyone, uh, HIC kind of ran out of money to fund the paving of that parking lot, and so it was just left as is. Let's find spots <laughs> for those milkweeds and put them in the ground. Wolf Prairie is a pocket prairie. Milkweed plant, it's the food that monarchs eat. A small replica of the once wide open coastal prairies of Texas. Our vision for this prairie is that eventually we get back to what it was 250 years ago, which would have been six to nine foot tall grasses mixed with forbs and other wildflowers, plus a few baseballs. <laughs> Having a, a prairie here on campus enables us to bring students out during the school day. We don't have to rent a bus. Anybody remember what these plants are? We just walk them outside and we have access to wild spaces. Why burning the prairie would have been helpful for its biodiversity? It's going to kill off invasives and then nutrients into the soil. I like to refer to it as the original classroom. The human mind is wired to be attentive to this. This is uh, called tickle tongue or ironwood. You get this weird tickling and numbing sensation on your tongue. This small pocket prairie has made a big impact on students like Akash. Even if I don't get to use this in my career, I definitely plan on being active in the community. Oh, hey you guys, come see, there's a black swallowtail larva here. This is a black swallowtail caterpillar, and it's just an example of um, how these little prairie patches, even though they're relatively small from a landscape scale, can be really great for pollinators. And you feel calmer, you said? Jaime Gonzalez calls himself a relationship counselor. I'm trying to fix a broken relationship between people and nature. I think we're working in a hybrid world. Technology is cool, but that nature, which is very ancient and a part of us, I think needs to be a part of our lives too because it, it keeps us grounded and healthy. That is the message behind author of Last Child in the Woods and co-founder of the Children in Nature Network, Richard Louvre. He explains the nature deficit disorder how a lack of exposure to nature can dull the senses and be harmful to one's health. Finally, the people who study child development began to pay attention to the question of how does experiences in nature shape childhood. It's gonna be good. Studies ongoing at the University of Illinois, for instance, show that kids with just a little bit of contact with nature just walk through trees in an urban park and the symptoms of attention deficit disorder begin to go down. The kids in the green schools did far better on standardized test scores. If children have less and less experience with nature, who will be the future stewards of the earth? The Katy Prairie near Houston has diminished from 600,000 acres 
to just 200,000. Now the Katy Prairie Conservancy has partnered with at least a dozen schools that have put in pocket prairies. This is exciting. We're going to be letting these uh, different kinds of grasshoppers go. Across town at the Coulter Elementary School's pocket prairie, these students are getting a lesson about the ecosystem. It's pretty cool because it has the red legs. Yeah, so those are kind of uh, like claws that help it grip onto stuff when it's jumping. Grasshoppers do a lot of things out on the prairie. They provide food for lots of other organisms like birds and mammals and other insects. They recycle nutrients on the prairie back for plant growth. <laughs> but I try to emphasize the good things that insects do and I think bringing them out and letting them touch bugs and showing them that when you hold bugs, not all of them are gonna bite. They actually do good things. I like to go out in the prairie and garden to grow plants because really nobody really wants to just sit in a class and see the textbooks and want to interact with and see all of them up close in real life. Yeah, I love it. It's actually kind of cool because Michonne, she's actually the one who does, who did most of it. It actually, it's kind of impressive. It used to look like this. Four years later, now it looks like this. Our idea was to let's just take a small amount and try to put back the plants and grasses and flowers that used to be here before urbanization. These are all going to be tall, like up to here. After decades of teaching, Ali and Sean got busy planting. I'm their, the Coulter Pocket Prairie Guardian. We call him Bison Bob, <laughs> named after my husband. And she's passionate about the prairie. You'll have all these tall yellow flowers. See these, these ones right here? Like all of these and these, they're going to be big, tall ones, lots of yellow on them. And then these grasses, like these are going to be, these are going to be tall. And this Indian grass is going to be tall with these golden waving seed heads. Some of them are like over my head. And so it's going to be great. And as much as she loves the prairie, it's what prairies do for us that gets her excited. Prairies actually really do a lot of good for the environment. You know, they sequester carbon dioxide, they hold water and the, the, all the prairie wetlands filter the water, so they help clean the water. So prairies really have a lot to offer to people. And people, of course, have a lot to offer to the prairies, especially saving them. Even businesses are realizing the benefits of a prairie. Why do we even have gardens at MD Anderson? And the underlying purpose, no matter what we do, is to create a positive distraction from the burdens of their care and treatment and to reduce stress and stress patients. And that's just what we do with the parks and gardens. Conservation groups have, have got to start putting nature where people are. This is one of the most heavily trafficked places in the whole Houston region, the Texas Medical Center. And so in addition to saving these big grand places like the Katy Prairie, we need to help people in the community find places right where they live and work to have nature. You see them, if you like see them through the glass, we're doing research right now in terms of how big of a grassland do you have to have an impact, but I will tell you this, for that one monarch that was passing by, just having access to a few flowers to fuel up on before it heads on, that's big enough for that monarch. Anytime we can situate a small patch of it anywhere, I think is a victory. Jason Johannesson is at DFW Airport to pick up some international visitors. The Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, traveling thousands of miles away to catch fish is not at all odd to them. Hello, hello. And that's what they do. Hello, Jason. How are you? Oh, hi. Good, good. Oh, you. Welcome to Texas. Isn't it lovely out there? Isn't it? Beautiful place. Mike and Joanne have arrived from England for one reason. They've come to Texas to catch fish. We would like two tickets. Um, fishing fish permits? Fishing license. Fishing oh, license it'll be. Okay, right over there at the counter. At the counter. I'm guessing that's you. Yeah, that's me, yes. It's a fresh water, um, obviously non-resident. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Great, thank you. You're looking for like spinner baits? Yeah, sort of thing, yes. Okay. Amazing, isn't it? After a bit of looking around. Looks like one, doesn't it? Is that a oh, buffalo? Beautiful. They're soon off. Legendary. Lake Fork. People know of Lake Fork 
as one of the world's premier bass fisheries. What a stunning view, look at that. And rightfully so. But Jason's clients don't come here for bass. Mike and Joanne catch these. Lovely looking carp. Fishing for carp is still Perfect. fairly new in America and a bit puzzling to some of the locals. Well, it seems a little odd to, to us Texans. I'm not from Europe. <laughs> Around here, they're a trash fish, but I understand carp fishing is very big in Europe. If Jason's new guide service is any indication, I think you'll enjoy it. Some interest is beginning to cross the pond. I am already, I think. Before the sun goes down, the week-long session of fishing has begun. All over Europe, primarily they go after carp. If you're a carp fisherman, you need a bit more time. Um, you need to relax and enjoy it, you know. Long session anglers basically sit up camp and live there for a while. Right, one more to do. It's fishing 24-7. Ready to go. Get your rods all set up, get your alarms set up. Because um, sometimes, obviously, you know, you could get a run three, four o'clock in the morning. It's big. In the wee hours, Joanne's alarm signals the first significant catch. Oh, it's a common. It's a common carp, an Asian fish found across Europe and North America. Good start, no. Not bad at all. Though Joanne and Mike are happy to catch it. You okay? Yeah. And they're sure to keep a few photos. That's it. These visitors have actually come to Texas to catch a whole different yes. animal. It's gone. Look at that, beautiful. Oh, hopefully, tonight we'll get a buffalo. No, not that kind. This kind, a smallmouth buffalo. It resembles a carp, but is actually a member of the sucker family. A lot of people think that buffalo is a type of carp, and it's actually not related. Uh, carp were introduced in the United States in 1870 or so. Buffalo is a native species, and buffalo get really big here. They've been captured over 100 pounds. It was in Austin in 2008 that Jason caught a 70-pound buffalo. Oh, that's a beautiful day. So the call of the buffalo has drawn Jason and a client from Germany back to Lake Austin's Emma Long Park. I saw a picture in, in the internet from Jason with a 70 pound uh, buffalo carp. And I thought I have to catch those fish. Florian is a well-known, well-respected fishing journalist in Germany. He's been here to fish for alligator gar as well. Nobody from Germany ever caught an alligator gar, so I put it into magazines and uh, many people said, Whoa, what is this, what, what a fish. And now it's the same with buffalo. Just a second. After their first full day of fishing, okay. neighboring campers have caught buffalo, but Florian and Jason have not. Any more bites or anything? No, nothing. nothing. Jason is keenly aware how far his client has traveled to catch these fish. Yeah, always a lot of pressure. <laughs> they redouble their efforts to draw them in. You have to have a plan B and a plan C and sometimes a plan D. Sometimes being mobile and moving quickly is the key to, to catching buffalo. Eventually, Jason and Florian decide to move their whole camp yards down the bank. New place, hopefully better luck. Their neighbors have enjoyed much more success using the same baits. Nice. Within minutes, He's got a fish. the new location pays off. That didn't take long. <laughs> that was quick. Yeah, let me get the net. Yay. <laughs> That's fishing, you never know. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I've been all over the world and I caught some very, very nice and big fish. When he catches one over 40 pounds, then I'll feel some relief. We don't have buffaloes in Europe, so it is a very good experience. They're magnificent fish. Word is spreading world-class buffalo and carp fishing can be found on Lake Austin and in the middle of Austin, on Ladybird Lake. Just ask the Bates brothers. This is one of the three best carp fishing waters in the whole of America. They are competing <laughs> with 16 other teams in an annual carp fishing tournament. 
This is the eighth annual Carp Anglers Group Austin Team Championships. Total team weight takes first prize. That's awesome. 43 pounds, 12 ounces. Casey Crawford just boosted his team standing by catching a new state record carp. <laughs> People ride around this, run around it, row in this lake all the time. Never have any idea that there's something that big under there. And I caught that one 10 foot off the bank, so your dog might have been swimming next to it. Bigger than your dog. <laughs> he slapped the shit out of me. I guess I deserve it. I did have a hook in his mouth. This is a big fella. Edmund Florence has gone carp fishing with his dad for most of his life. Good one. When I was like five, we got into a carp tournament just for the heck of it. Oh, today, that's his second buffalo. A beautiful 35 pound buff. Bringing in something that big is a miracle. My friend, he thinks a 12 pound fish is big. We really need to take him fishing. Got to get that one still. Oh, you take your reel off, eh? Yeah. We've been lucky today. We've caught about five right here. Fishing was very good. At the end of the day, the anglers meet to share dinner. Are we missing anybody? Story. That is a huge fish. And a few awards. The Bates Brothers with 550.69 pounds. Congratulations on your ATC victory. We really never knew until right now. Great job. We've had a second, a third, and a fourth in the other three years. But, um, First is much nicer. We never got one of these for coming second. Right, Nelson. Those who caught Thanks the biggest so fish even go and, home uh, with a little extra cash, including Edmund Flores, who wins the prize for the largest buffalo. Congratulations, go play Nintendo. All right. <laughs> In case you were wondering, Florian never did catch a 70-pound buffalo, but he did go back to Germany with plenty of stories. That's been absolutely brilliant. Mike and Joanne returned to England happy as well. We just love to travel for the carp to different countries. And sometimes we do more camping than catching. <laughs> this trip, like all the best ones, had both. Hey. That's it. Perfect. <laughs> You're always so close to nature. It's just lovely to be outside. Gorgeous, isn't it? That's a nice picture. You couldn't ask for any better. It's definitely worthwhile. It's the first time in Texas, I think we'll be coming back. Beautiful. And, it, it, and it's better for the hill country to have a good water catching landscape. Same thing. A group of landowners is gathered to listen to the wisdom of Steve Nelly. Butterflies love it. They just come to it like candy. We're here at the C.L. Browning Ranch in Blanco County, Texas for the first of a series of field days hosted by the Hill Country Land Trust. European settlers came and Steve is there as somebody like? whose reputation is so strong that people look forward to hearing from him. It would be a spotty. You know, and so that he's a very him. gentle persuader of getting in touch with that deep urge inside of yourself to be a careful steward of what you've been privileged to have. Put it through your own test of logic and experience. He has this gift for connecting with people wherever they are. Well, even though we're trained in the technical skills of plants and animals and soil and conservation, sort of the sciences, we can do better. When we go onto farms and ranches, we're really more in the people business. If you want to recover plant diversity, leaving that cedar slash, that blanket, it's priceless. Steve consults with landowners and natural resource professionals to provide a holistic approach to land management. He wants people to get it and he wants people to share what they know. He's walking the walk. Steve has touched thousands of landowners over his career and in working with us on workshops. And the one thing that Steve does such a great job of is talking about how what we do way up in the uplands can also impact what happens down in that stream. And so he talks about where 
conservation begins where that first raindrop falls. County officials say the river rose 12 to 14 feet in just half an hour, engulfing the Blanco River and shattering a record set in 1929. The roar was tremendous. There was just devastation. Um, the riparian area was stripped of all vegetation. And so the height of the flood here was, I understand you said it's over 40 feet. With two big floods in one year, you get pretty down and you, you sort of feel hopeless almost. Lots of good grasses here. At times you just want to cry and throw up your hands and say, what's the use? Oh, and looky here, the seed head. But he reminds you that nature is very resilient and it will recover. Lots of little baby plants around here, lots of baby trees. Uh, walk with a landowner across an area that's been devastated and yeah, find a few good things and you can show them uh, how nature's trying to recover and heal this area back up. In Texas, creeks and rivers, you know, they're kind of the circulatory system of the land, but they're also a way that people connect with nature. So it's a special motivation for me and others to do our very best because we feel like we're, you know, helping other people take care of God's creation. Gonzalo. When people come to our agency, often the first person they see is Paul. <laughs> and he does his level best and always has to help everybody, no matter what. Hey, man, how's it going? Pretty good, sir. Yourself? Can you help me gut this fish? <laughs> <laughs> There's no telling what, what they'd say. Uh, what do you feed a bobcat? Well, I've got some fancy feast here. You think uh, chicken or tuna? Paul's the kind of person that'll do anything for you. Um, he goes out of his way, even if he doesn't know you, to help you. It's always kind of the back of the mind goal. Somebody walks in, they leave happier than when they came in. I don't feel so good. Oh, man. Anything about the history of the agency, how it works, people to call to get information, he's been the guy to go to. It's kind of hard to do his evaluation now. He, he's, so, he's so good at everything that he does, we have to, you know, make a special category for him, you know? So I don't know if it had been done before or not. Probably so. It's probably not in the room. It makes my day. Every time I walk in here, it makes it, it, makes it a lot better. He's always uh, the friendly face, the smiley face, the best person to see in the morning when you walk in. And he can tell when you walk into the building how your day is going, and I, I just appreciate his intuition. I guess that I just uh, I enjoy helping people and I enjoy making people happy. Here we go. Thanks so much. Everybody has bad days. If you have someone that breaks you out of the rut, that can be all the difference in the world. Do you live out by on Lake Travis somewhere near Pale Face Park? I think this is, it, it's a snake that's indigenous to that area and I forget the name of it.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.